It's Friday, 18 December. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel, and today we're going to discuss part two of the tragic loss of the B-17-909 based on the NTSB factual report. In part one, we talked about how the B-17 came down in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Today, we're going to discuss more about why the B-17 came down. And it's going to involve numbers, engines number three and four and their respective ignition systems. Maintaining an aircraft as big and complex as the B-17 with an all-volunteer force is like maintaining the Golden Gate Bridge. You start at one end of the airplane and work on it until you get to the other end of the airplane and then turn around and go back to the beginning and start over. This is done through what's called a periodical maintenance program. Every aircraft under Part 91 is required to have an annual inspection where you open up all the inspection panel panels on the airplane and do a thorough inspection of it airframe and engines but on a plane like a b-17 that's on um, tour throughout most of the year you need to put it on a periodical maintenance program where every 25 hours you take one of the engines and approximately one-fourth of the airframe and do a 25-hour inspection on that section of the airplane 25 hours later you move on to the next engine and the next portion of the airframe such that by the time 100 hours of flying time comes around you've inspected the entire aircraft and you start that process all over again this process is typically done on the road while the B-17 is on tour. On the B-17, there are approximately three volunteer A&P airframe and power plant mechanics that help maintain the B-17, and they work directly under the supervision of Mac McCauley, who's not only the aircraft commander in the left seat with the most experience in the B-17, probably of anybody in the world at this time, but he's also the director of maintenance of the B-17. In fact, I believe he's the director of maintenance for all the aircraft in the Collings Foundation that are to report directly to the Orlando FISDO office. That's the FAA Flight Standards District Office out of Orlando, Florida. Why Orlando? Because during the off-season the B-17 is based in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. So the mechanics, the volunteer mechanics, work directly for MAC and MAC reports directly to the director of operations Robert Collings and then Robert Collings does the coordination with the FAA via the Orlando FISDO and as we learned in part one there basically was no supervision from the Orlando FISDO for a couple of years at least a couple of years engines number three and four which are the suspected problematic engines in this situation were was sent down to vintage radials in bakersfield california where they opened up these engines and inspected them following the crash basically there was nothing found terribly wrong with the insides of the engines that is all the bearings and bushings there was no reason to see that the engines were seized up but they did find numerous problems with the engines ignition system let's go inside and take a look at that before we dive into the engines i wanted to bring up something from yesterday i was going to get more in depth about the way that mac reached up and caged number four engine the NTSB is investigating heavily the lack of CRM or crew resource management applied in this case here of the B-17. So they've included this checklist uh, from the B-17 manual about how to shut down an engine in flight or on takeoff. 
And it shows, like most multi-engine aircraft, you want to do this as together as a crew to prevent shutting down a wrong engine or the wrong engine. And this is broken down between pilot and co-pilot duties on the, in the B-17 manual. Now, the Collings Foundation and the FAA approved their own engine failure checklist in flight for the Collings Foundation, and this checklist does not break down the difference between pilot duties and co-pilot duties. Now, the question, did Mac shut down the correct engine? I think if we look at the evidence here, I believe... Mac was correct in shutting down the number four engine. Okay, now let's dive into the power plants, group chairman's factual report, about 134 pages. Let's start with the summary. The engines installed on the airplane were Curtis Wright Cyclone R1820 nine-cylinder radial engines. The number three and four engines were shipped to vintage radials in Tehachapi, California for disassembly and examination in the presence of the members of the power plants group on February 11th to the 20th of 2020. The disassembly and examination of the two engines did not reveal any pre-existing mechanical defects or failures. However, the examination of the number three engines, piston and spark plugs, showed evidence of detonation that would have resulted in significant loss of engine power. We'll explain more about detonation in a minute. The examination of the number four engine showed the P lead, that's the primary lead. This is the, well, we'll explain more of that in a minute too. The P lead to the left and right magnetos was separated from the magnetos housing. The leads to the left magneto was completely out of the housing, allowing the grounding tab to contact the housing and shorting it out, effectively grounding or turning off that magneto. When a piece of cardboard was placed between that grounding tab and the magneto case wall, all nine ignition leads sparked. The lead to the right magneto was partially engaged, so the grounding tab was not contacting the case. But the gap between the points, this is the points inside that magneto, was less than the required minimum, and when the magneto was tested, the number eight cylinders ignition lead did not spark at all, and the sparks for the other Eight cylinders ignition leads were weak and intermittent. So that's a description of the two magnetos on the number four engine, the engine that Mac shut down. So let's go into more detail on that. The magnetos are the self contained generators that provide the spark for the ignition system on airplane engines. Each engine has two magnetos. Remember, each magneto fires its own set of spark plugs, and each cylinder on aircraft engines has two sets of spark plugs. So in the case of these radial engines, the 1820s, one mag fires the entire front row of spark plugs and the other mag fires the entire rear row of spark plugs. And an engine can run on one magneto, but you're gonna lose at least 100 RPM or more. Okay, here we're looking at the magnetos on the back of the number four engine, the engine that Mac shut down left magneto and right magneto. What investigators found was that the P lead, or the primary lead, which should be attached to the magneto with a clip, was instead attached to the magneto with a single strand of safety wire. There's record of this being done back in 2015, which is about the time that this engine was overhauled. Remember, this engine had about 1,100 hours since major overhaul and was getting close to reaching TBO, or the time between overhaul. The other three engines had less than 300 hours each. What this primary lead does is it grounds or turns on and off the magneto. Normally, if a P lead is open, an open circuit, that magneto would fail to the hot position and would continue to fire. But there's a built-in safety feature to these magnetos that investigators found that this one left mag, I believe it was, was not firing. On the other end of this P lead, as it enters into this magneto, is a hard-tipped ferrule. When this hard-tipped ferrule enters into the magneto, it's going to move a copper alloy tab that prevents the grounding of the magneto. This is a safety feature. Let me show you over here on the next picture. Here we are looking at the inside of the magneto where the P lead enters this magneto. This 
Farrell pushes this copper alloy tab out of the way. That's this tab right here. It comes through this hole here and pushes down on this tab. And the idea is this is a built-in safety feature such that when you remove the mags from the airplane or you remove the P-lead from the airplane, it grounds the magneto so that the engine or magneto will not fire. Since this P-lead was only safety wired in and did not have the proper retaining clip that it was originally designed to have to hold it in place, this entire P-lead came out and on the left mag here, that allowed the left magneto to ground because this copper alloy tab that is what operates the points on the magneto to ground out against the case right here. On the right magneto, this tab was still ungrounded. Remember, a magneto is hot until it is grounded, and the P-leads are what ground the magneto, and the P-leads go to the ignition switch up in the cockpit. So if this had come apart before the aircraft crashed, that would mean that the left magneto would have failed. Now, the aircraft would continue to run on the right magneto, but investigators looked more into the right magneto and found that it, too, was beginning to fail. So with one whole magneto grounded or shut off, you would see a significant at least 100 RPM drop right away in the number four engine. And just to be clear, this is not the normal method of grounding the magneto. This is only a built-in safety feature for when you're working on the magneto. The P-lead normally grounds the magneto via the ignition switch up in the cockpit. Presumably, with the left mag failed, that left the number four engine running on the right mag. On the right magneto, investigators found that the points points internal to the right magneto were improperly gapped. The proper gap for the points is eight to ten thousandths. The gap on the right magneto was at six thousandths of an inch, a small gap which will create a weak spark. Remember the points are ungrounded by the primary lead and then the points open and close based on the rotation of this cam which is time to the engine. By opening up the points, you collapse the primary circuit, which induces a large current into the secondary coil circuit and produces the spark for the spark plugs. So a good, clean opening of those points is critical to a good spark. And that has to be internally timed correctly inside the magneto. There is a second magneto timing, which we don't talk about in this investigation. And what I want to know is, what was the magneto timing to the engine like? Two types of timing in a magneto. Internal timing and then magneto to engine timing. We do not know what the magneto to engine timing was on these engines based on this report. So investigators put the magnetos on the test bench and ran them up. First, they found the left mag wouldn't work because it was grounded. When they put a piece of, of uh, cardboard in between the tab that was grounded out against the case, they found that the left mag worked okay. The right magneto, they say the right magneto leads number one through seven and nine would spark. Ignition lead eight would not spark. The sparks observed from the ignition leads numbers one through seven and nine were all very weak. That's because the points the points gap was too small, plus po possibly some other issues. In addition, the operation of the right magneto was intermittent. So on the number four engine, the left mag has failed because it grounded, and the right mag is intermittent at best. So that does seem to indicate that Mac did have a good reason for shutting down and feathering number four engine. Here they opened up the mags and checked the primary and secondary coils. The primary coil should have a minimum reading of 1.01 ohm. The secondary coil should have a minimum resistance of 3,900 ohms. And they found both coils were underperforming. 
To assist the points with opening and closing cleanly without arcing is a condenser. A condenser acts like a gate and absorbs the initial energy from the primary circuit once the points begin to open to prevent arcing of the points. The, it was found by investigators at it was found by investigators at S&T that the condenser in the right mag failed its leak test which would add to that magneto creating a weak spark and would also contribute to arcing and pitting of the points. Investigators also found on the right magneto that the cam follower was worn below limits and that the cam itself was scored and worn on the cam lobes. Here's what it looks like on the inside of one of these radial engines, the connecting rod master rod assembly, and they found that basically the internals to these engines looked to be operational. So now we'll move on to the number three engine, which we don't have a lot of information about. The magnetos were bench tested for the number three engine and tested okay, but we don't know a lot about the timing of the magnetos. What they do report is that number three engine appears to have suffered detonation. And here's some of the photo evidence they're showing on the number four cylinder the damage to the top of the piston and the top edges of the piston showing signs of detonation. What's detonation? Detonation is the rapid burning of fuel instead of the proper burning of fuel upon combustion. You want a nice steady burn to efficiently push that piston down into the cylinder, whereas detonation, the fuel is burning too quickly and it's slapping the piston down and it's beginning to damage the piston it's a f the same thing as what we used to call engine knock in our cars. Of course, an airplane's so noisy, like the B-17, it's hard. You don't hear the knocking, but you're going to see a reduced a reduction in the performance of the engine when the engine is detonating. One of the primary causes of engine detonation is incorrect ignition timing, specifically overly advanced ignition timing. If detonation is allowed to continue, it can heat the cylinders up so much that it can lead to a condition called pre-ignition, where the entire fuel-air mixture combusts well before top dead center. And this can blow cylinder heads off, bed connecting rods, and, and cause the engine to fail fairly quickly, very quickly. Now, this is cylinder number five of engine number three, and it's busted apart. But cylinder number five, the cylinders are numbered from looking at the rear of the engine, this is one of the lower cylinders. I suspect this cylinder damage is not necessarily from pre-ignition or detonation, but is probably more likely damaged from the crash as this number three engine ended up on top of the de-icing tank. The number nine cylinder, one of the upper cylinders on number three engine, showed quite a bit of corrosion. For a, especially for an engine that's less than 300 hours since major overhaul uh, and not too long ago. Inside the barrel, this should be all very shiny. There's an incredible amount of corrosion inside that barrel. I doubt that much corrosion would happen in between the time of the accident and the time of, of this photograph. And then there's the telltale story of the spark plugs themselves. And this was brought out in the preliminary report. A set of spark plugs to a mechanic is like reading a good book. From just reading the color and the condition of the spark plugs, a mechanic can tell a lot about an engine's condition. Whether it's running the proper mixture, too lean of a mixture, too rich of a mixture, burning oil, cracked rings, detonation, excessive carbon deposits, a lot of different information can be read just by read looking at the spark plugs and reading them correctly. And in the case of these spark plugs, here's from number three engine, and the same story on number four engine, nearly all, this, all of the spark plugs that investigators looked at suffered from excessive clearance on the spark plugs. They were not properly gapped. With excessive clearance, that's going to introduce too much resistance into the circuit and exacerbate the weak spark that the magnetos were already suffering from. Aviation spark plugs are completely reusable and need to be cleaned and gapped regularly. According to their interviews, the members of the Collings Foundation stated that they did not have a bead 
They did not have a bead blasting tool with them while on tour and would often just replace worn spark plugs with new ones. Here's an example of a complete spark plug cleaning setup with the bead blaster over here, and then you can test the spark plug under pressure over here, and there's, of course, your feeler gauge right there. And then you can gap the spark plugs with one of these bench tools right here. Very easy, simple spark plug gapping tool set. Based on all the evidence uncovered during this preliminary investigation, the FAA rescinded the Collings Living History Flight Experience Exemption on the 20th of May of 2020. So I hope this gives you a better understanding of what happened to the B-17-909 and the tragic loss in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. And like the NTSB itself, the idea of this video series is not to place blame, but rather prevent this from happening in the future. And one of the lessons that we're gonna, that's gonna come out of all this is that no one single person, person should have direct operational control of such a complex operation. Operational oversight, and supervision needs to be maintained. Thanks so much for your support of this channel, especially over on Patreon and PayPal that make this content possible. See you here.